All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. All right. Um, oh, I have an echo. That's really bad. Sorry about that. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Oh, I have an echo. Voila. I think that's it. Uh, welcome to this new edition of the Worldwide uh, Neuro Dev Forum. Uh, today's uh, guest is Pierre van der Hagen from Brussels. As always, before we, we introduce the speaker, I have a few um, communications, the usual recommendations to students and to postdocs to take this opportunity to ask questions. It's a good training. Uh, just jump in, something relating to um, the organization of this series of seminars. You might have seen in the waiting room that we have a full house until the end of this year. I'm starting to think of new speakers for the next um, semester, so for, for 2021, for the next series of waves where we'll be all staying at home. Um, do not hesitate to contact me either on Twitter or on my website if you have recommendations for speakers. I'm talking here particularly to the students and the postdoc. If, uh, if you have uh, uh, someone you'd like to hear or somebody whose work you like, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to, 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 to look in, into this uh, for you. So this being said, uh, let's turn back to our speaker uh, today, Pierre van der Hagen. Pierre um, is um, uh, currently a professor and group leader at the VIB in Leuven, so in Belgium, this at the Center for Brain and Disease Research. And he's also uh, um, at the Institute of Interdisciplinary Research um, um, in, uh, in Brussels. So Pierre is trained uh, as a medical doctor, Brussels again. He did his PhD in, on um, olfactory receptors in the lab of uh, Gilbert Vassar, uh, after which um, he um, went uh, to the US. I'm a bit confused here because I don't have my notes uh, that are scrolling the way they are, but basically did his um, PhD in the US uh, focusing this time on uh, um, thalamocortical projections and aerial diversity before uh, coming back to uh, Belgium, and um, here you go. Sorry about that, Pierre. Uh, axonal guidance in John Flanagan's lab at Harvard Medical School, and then moved back to the ULB uh, to uh, start his lab and focusing on cortical um, development. So Pierre has a very interesting line of research on uh, timing of development, on uh, the importance of, of some uh, spe human specific factors in uh, development and trying to highlight uh, what makes us um, so different from the rest of our, of our uh, mammalian uh, uh, relatives. As you might have guessed from uh, either, well, as you might know from knowing Pierre or might have guessed from some of the ads I've put out, Pierre has a uh, an extensive and active extracurricular life, in particular in the uh, field of music, rock and roll. Uh, he showed us some of his talents, in particular uh, in Nara, where he's been dubbed the Red Elvis of Nara by one of its most uh, <laughs> one of its most prominent uh, citizens. So, um, of course, you know, uh, with this broad range of interests and, and sharp scientific mind, um, uh, it's 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 a really a fruitful, exciting, and um, um, friendship-promoting um, combination. And so, Pierre, I'm, I'm really happy to, to have you here. I'll stop here and um, give you the, the stage, the screen, and uh, the, the world, in fact. Cool. All right. So... So start by, by sharing the desktop. Yes, that's what I'm doing actually. But um, maybe I'll try again. Mm -hmm. There we go. Good, yeah. Is that working? It is. It is. You see a slide and you hear me? It's all good. Okay, fantastic. So thanks a lot, Denis, for the so kind invitation, and thanks a lot, everybody, to be to be there. Um, I must say it's quite an experience. I'm, I, I'm probably not the first one to say that, to be in front of so many people and yet uh, not seeing even one of them. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting experience, but I'll I'll, I'll try to cope with it. So um, again, I'm I'm trying actually to see the face of all the people I know. <laughs> 
uh, putting them in my mind and, and hope that we'll get to see each other uh, very soon uh, when all of this so is, is sort of over. All right, so without further ado, um, I want to tell you a little bit uh, about what we're doing uh, in the lab and what we've been doing uh, over the last few years and few months and even few weeks um, about the, the, the mechanisms of development of the cortex and how they relate to, uh, to human brain uh, evolution. And you will see that a lot of it will have to do with the, the, the control of, of timing of development. And I hope that I'll convince you that this may be actually an emerging and very interesting team in particular in related to evolution. So I, I think many of you know that uh, the cerebral cortex is the most divergent structure in our brain. Uh, it is to a large extent what makes us uh, arguably what we are as individuals, as a species. Um, the human uh, cortex compared with non-human species is characterized by increased neuronal number, uh, in particular uh, in specific areas and layers. Um, in addition to that, uh, neurons actually display uh, specific features, and that's what I'm trying to show you here, uh, such as increased size, increased uh, synapse density, and all of that culminating, increased number and increased uh, synapse density with increased diversity of, of connectivity. And I think really it, it, it's a very exciting moment today in developmental neurobiology to try to understand what is it, does it that is behind mechanistically increased neuronal number and increased neuronal uh, diversity and connectivity in, in the human cortex. But what I'd uh, rather uh, discuss with you today is actually an, another feature of human brain development, human cortex development, which is its prolonged development, meaning that the timing uh, according to which uh, the events uh, that go from the neural plate to cortical development are actually considerably extended in time. And even though at first one might think that this is just a trivial issue that has to do with uh, pregnancy, duration, lifespan, uh, or whatever, uh, I think I think a lot of us uh, start to think that this is actually not a trivial issue, but quite an interesting one. And just to give you here two striking examples, at least striking to me, and that we try to tackle in the lab. First one is prolonged neurogenesis, meaning the time taken uh, by the cortex to generate uh, all the neurons that will populate its six layers. So it's about seven days in the mouse. It's more than four months in the human. So considerable expansion. And the macaque, for instance, would be uh, in between there. So that's and, and you may say, what would, be, what would be the evolutionary impact of prolonged neurogenesis? Well, considering uh, that this allows for many more cell divisions, it allows actually to expansion of uh, the output of neurons, and so uh, the expansion of neuronal number. And then the second uh, aspect that I will discuss mostly today is the prolonged neuronal maturation. And here are a few examples that I want to uh, remind you. For instance, in a one month old infant, you can see that the pyramidal neurons are not that developed yet, while in six years old, uh, you can see how dramatically their dendritic arbors have complexified. Similarly, you can see here anatomical data about dendritic spines, where you see that it takes about two years to get to maximal amount of spines along the, the dendritic shafts of uh, pyramidal neurons in some areas of the human cortex. Uh, while well, it would take only a few months in the macaque, for instance, and uh, maybe two, three weeks in, in the mouse. Uh, and here you can see a, a depiction that basically means that both synaptogenesis, synaptic pruning, and what, what collectively we can call also plasticity is considerably prolonged. And that actually has been recognized for a, a very long time and is called by some the concept of human neoteny. So, retention of juvenile properties in a mature organism that is particularly prominent for the brain and that is thought perhaps to be at the origin of the emergence of highly complex cognitive features that would be dependent on a prolonged period of plasticity, more social interaction and, and, and the emergence of a, a, a genuine culture, if you wish, even though it's not uh, strict sensu human specific. So this is really what we're wondering in the lab uh, nowadays. What is it that is behind prolonged neurogenesis? What is it that is behind prolonged neuronal maturation? Um, and how did we get interested into this? Well, often 
it's it's the data that basically uh, triggered our interest in a, in a particular con concept. And in this case, well, it's a number of years ago where we were trying to mimic normal patterns of uh, neurogenesis from pluripotent stem cells, and where we found sorry, I'm yeah, I I, I missed I mixed up uh, my slides here, but it doesn't matter. Uh, what I what I want to show you here is basically that starting from pluripotent stem cells, you can generate uh, an array of cortical neurons that correspond uh, to the identity of the six layers. But interestingly, while in the mouse, it takes about one week in the dish, it takes uh, more than three months in the dish for human cells. So suggesting that those differences I was highlighting in vivo are actually conserved uh, uh, in the dish, suggesting an intrinsic species-specific pathway of neurogenesis. And in fact, uh, just to give you an example, this is something that we noticed years ago where mixing mouse and human stem cells and launching cortical differentiation, we could see that human cells that you see in green here are still after two weeks expanding as uh, neuropathial cells and radioglial cells, while the mouse cells have almost all of them differentiated into neurons. So suggesting again a strongly intrinsic component of the timing differences of neurogenesis between, in this case, mouse and uh, human. And we've been exploring this uh, at a more molecular level, in particular, the protraction of neurogenesis. And uh, we've been able to show some time ago now that among many other mechanisms, well, there is the emergence of specific genes in the human genome, such as this NOTCH2NL, a gene family that uh, act as human specific modifiers of the very important NOTCH pathway. And thereby we think lead to increased uh, um, and prolonged and increased self-renewal of radial glial cells and thereby prolonged uh, neurogenesis and thereby potentially would explain part of the increased size of the cortex uh, in our species. So again, uh, emphasizing the potential importance of the divergence of intrinsic mechanisms to explain the divergence of, at the global scale, uh, 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 complexification of the human cortex. Now, what about patterns of human cortical neuron maturation, which I would really like to focus today, uh, even though the other topic is quite interesting, but for the sake of time, I, I had to make a choice. And so how we got interested in human cortical neuron maturation? Well, it's again, just by performing experiments and finding surprising results. Uh, in this case, uh, what we were doing is to, to try to model later aspects of development of neurons uh, mouse or human using transplantation. So basically starting from pluripotent stem cells, we differentiate them into cortical cells and then we transplant them in the mouse. And the, the, the very simplistic idea here is that if we put them in the mouse, they would be able to show us, so to speak, what they're able to do in action and whether they can actually behave as functional neurons. This is something that we started more than 10 years ago. And I will share with you uh, the most recent data that I think enable us to start to answer, well, yes, I, they, they are able to do so. But interestingly, they do so following a specific uh, process that is uh, species-specific, in particular with re in relation with the timing. And that is what I will uh, uh, try to entertain with you today, mostly. So let's start with the mouse. If you transplant cortical cells derived from stem cells, in the mouse neonate, and you look uh, about a month, well, you will start to get these pyramidal neurons nicely developed and integrated in the mouse cortex, while uh, and, and one month of development more or less corresponds uh, to, the, to the normal timeline, I would say, of uh, cortical pyramidal neurons. But interestingly, uh, and this was originally the work of Nicola Gaspar, a graduate student in the lab, but then when Ira Espuni Camacho, a postdoc in the lab, uh, sort of repeated this experiment in with human cells, what she found to her surprise is that it doesn't take one month, two months, but more than nine months to get to a similar morphological uh, maturation. And so that suggested to us that perhaps this protracted maturation I I've been uh, discussing with you that is uh, quite specific of the human species compared with non-human species in vivo may be recapitulated in these cells. So perhaps there is an intrinsic component of human neoteny in the neurons. Now, of course, we proposed that at the time, but I would say in a rather shy way, because there, there were a lot of pitfalls, and I think there still are, about this, this model of intrinsic uh, 
control of, of timing and neoteny. One of them is shown to you here is that most of the cells that are transplanted are actually in this original type of experiment um, clustered with one another in clumps of cells so that they're actually not so much integrated with the rest of the brain. So they may follow their own path just because they're at the wrong place and that what we're seeing is just an artifact basically. Also the way they could connect in a functional way in, 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 such, a, uh, in such clusters of cells uh, is indeed debatable. And you can think of other uh, uh, reasons why we see such a protracted timing, including the fact that these human neurons obviously were not programmed, whether in development or evolution, to ever land into a mouse, uh, a mouse brain. And that we still don't know at this point whether we, we still did not know at that point whether they could actually be functional. So that's what I'll be telling you about now is our efforts to basically address those various questions. How can we uh, make sure that these cells that display this timeline uh, are actually doing it in a physiological way? And so to do this, uh, something very important that uh, several people in the lab, but I highlight here in particular, uh, Ryoe uh, Iwata, postdoc in the lab, was basically to improve the technology of transplantation that we were using in the lab, in particular combining cell transplantation with EGTA injection that enables basically the cells, thanks to this calcium chelator, to uh, go into small bridges uh, formed in the ventricular zone due to the, the calcium chelation, and then integrate through migration uh, uh, with the, the radial glia that is still present in neonates. Um, and why is that interesting? Well, because then it allows, when you look at these cells later on, in the best cases like the one I show here, to see many neurons, actually, uh, human neurons that are well embedded in the, in the cortex, uh, in the cortical tissue as single cells, so to speak. Meaning that they are now not in a special environment, they are in the mouse physiological environment, and in principle, uh, are able to do, well, I would say whatever they have in mind or whatever they could follow from the intrinsic uh, environment. So a much better uh, physiologically relevant transplantation experiment, if you will. And so we look then in a lot of detail, uh, in many ways, at the transplanted neurons. And I'm showing you here a couple of results. And this was uh, the work uh, largely of Daniele Linaro, postdoc in the lab, who now has a professor position in university of Milano. And what uh, Daniele did a lot, he's a physiologist by training, is to basically take slices prepared from these transplanted animal and look at their function and their morphology following biocytin injection in the cells that uh, he was patching from. And here you can see, for instance, that it takes five months for these human neurons to display repetitive action potentials following depolarization, which is a, a classical indication of functional maturation. So suggesting that even in these conditions, these human neurons take uh, quite a long time, basically, to, uh, to reach uh, functional maturation. And interestingly, since we could look at the morphology uh, of the cells following the same timeline, well, what Daniele could uh, show is that basically dendritic arbor complexification, as you can see here. And here even dendritic spine maturation and densification follow also a protracted timeline that is actually strikingly uh, coordinated, if you will, so that if you plot basically, for instance, resting potential and spine density, which are not thought to be linked biologically, on the one hand, you have the, the, the capacity to fire action potential. On the other hand, you have how, how dense your spines are, even though neuronal activity could be at play, of course. But, but still, you would think that the upstream mechanisms are quite different, and yet you see that they develop in a highly correlated fashion. Here, same for dendritic length and resting membrane potential, for instance. So this to us indicated that the development of the neurons resembled very much what goes on in the human brain, perhaps, even though, of course, we've never looked with that level of detail, but at least looks physiologically uh, relevant and, as I said, uh, uh, coordinated. So this somehow is addressing the question of whether the development looks physiological and whether the prolonged timeline may indeed reflect a physiological timeline and not just a, an artifact, so to speak. Now, another uh, important experiment that is still ongoing, actually, because it, it, it's not an easy one, is to ask whether this can be true for other types of species that we test. And this is basically what we've been starting to do with Rio, 
uh, Rioé and, and Daniele, by transplanting not only human, but also macaque cortical cells derived from pluripotent stem cells. And here the idea is that, as I told you, that macaque cortex develops quite faster than the human, but slower than the mouse. Well, again, if the timeline that we see is reminiscent of what goes on in vivo, we should see an intermediate timeline of differentiation of these neurons following xenotransplantation in the mouse. And from the data that we obtained so far, this, is, uh, this seems to be rather the case. So for instance, if we transplant following the same patterns of differentiation, cortical cells from, derived from human or macaque species, you can see that after two and a half months, the macaque cells appear to be much more developed in terms of dendritic outgrowth, as well as in terms of dendritic spine, density, and morphology. <clears throat> so all of all, this would suggest that it's not just by putting human cells in mouse cells that you get this weird result of slow maturation, but that you can actually get a faster maturation by transplanting a faster uh, a neuron coming from a, a species that is characterized by faster development. And by the way, we've looked in more detail as well at the development of the mouse neurons following transplantation since the, the original data of Nicola 10 years ago. And again, they develop much faster than what you see here with the macaque cell. So it suggests that there seems to be a nice correlation between the timeline of these neurons that we can observe in vivo physiologically and that we can observe in the xenotransplanted cells when they integrate a single cell. So this would all strongly suggest that there is an intrinsic component in their maturation. Now, uh, a key question uh, then is, what are they capable to do as they develop? And one thing then that we started to look at is basically to look at how this development is actually take, taking place in real time, so to speak. And in that sense, uh, we got very lucky actually, because we started these experiments as we moved to Leuven about two years ago. And we started collaborating with a, a neighbor there at NERV, the, the lab of Vincent Bonin, and in particular with Ben Vermaer, who uh, joined our lab basically, and as a joint postdoc in, in Vincent and our lab, did, I think, uh, quite remarkable work to follow in real time how these neurons develop, and as I will show you a little later, how they actually can work. So uh, all of this was performed basically using in vivo imaging. So you all know multi-photon imaging, where you can do surgery on the mouse and then using multi-photon uh, microscopy, look in live animals at morphology or more recently using GCAM, for instance, looking at uh, the function of the neurons. And so this is basically what uh, a lot of people do now uh, in the mouse. And here, well, we've done basically that, but focusing on transplanted human neurons. And you can see here typically a region of interest in such an optical window and how we can then dive and find uh, what I'll show you in a moment when the human neurons are fluorescently labeled with a, a classical fluorescent protein. You can see basically diving here through the depth of the brain how, um, how uh, they, uh, in this case, display these uh, amazing branches and dendritic spines throughout the depth of, uh, of the cortex. Now, why is that interesting? Because we thought we can now look not only at the anatomy of the spine, but we can look at the dynamics of the spines, which, as many of you probably remember or know, um, is actually a, a very nice proxy of the development of synapses and of the dynamics of synapses that is characterized at juvenile stages by highly unstable synapses that come and go until later on uh, in what I would say characterizes the adult stage, uh, they become uh, uh, stable. And this takes basically about three to four weeks in, uh, uh, in the mouse. So how about with these human cells? So for that, uh, Ben set up basically a whole pipeline to analyze individual branches, individual spines of these neurons following transplantation. I won't go into all the details, but he could then follow in real time individual branches and spines over time. And what he found basically are two interesting things, I think. On the one hand, what he found is that looking at what we call early stages, three to six months after transplantation, you can see hopefully that those spines are actually quite unstable. Many disappear, some uh, remain stable, but some will appear. And this goes on here uh, for more than a month, uh, basically, as you can see here. So highly unstable and dynamic process at these 
rather early stages, uh, even though, of course, we are in an adult mouse here. But then if you look later on, after six months, you can see that now the spines have increased in size, in density, but that they appear to be much more stable. So this is highly reminiscent, basically, of what goes on uh, uh, in the mouse. And we analyze and quantify this in detail. And you can see that, basically, over this protracted almost year of time, you have a double of dendritic spine density. You have uh, a sharp decrease in the turnover of the spines, as well as an increase in their survival fraction, so the time that they can remain as stable structures. And that's, these are the classical ways by which it, it, it can be looked at, and it was looked at uh, in rodents. And here you can compare here the data, for instance, from uh, Anthony Holmat uh, when he was in uh, Karl Svoboda's lab. And you can see that basically the turnover rate that is found in the mouse already uh, at three months uh, is basically uh, the one that we only see much later on with human cells. And similarly with the survival time, that is actually already quite high at three months uh, compared with what we see here with the human cells. So overall, what it means is that the dendritic spines in the human cells develop along their intrinsic and species-specific timeline. And that these neurons are not just, let's say, waiting in the brain uh, for something that would never come, uh, including <laughs> a human brain, for instance, but that they actually are highly dynamic uh, and follow something that looks very much like physiological dendritic spine development, but followed by spine stabilization, suggesting that in the end, they are able to make a lot of connections given their many spines along their shafts. So is that the case? So we've looked at that in many, in many, in many ways. Um, we've looked at that using electrophysiology. Daniele has shown, for instance, I haven't time to show you here, but very nice uh, synaptic connectivity between very robust uh, synaptic connectivity between mouse cells and human cells, uh, including displaying long-term potentiation, for instance. Rabies virus uh, experiments were also performed that show a high ratio of connectivity between mouse neurons and human neurons. But what I'd rather show you is, I think, the sort of bulletproof experiment that together with Ben and Vincent, uh, together with Rio as well, to, to, to make all these mice uh, and these neurons, we basically looked at the function of the neurons in uh, what I would call a physiological task in an awake mouse animal. So basically what we did is to transplant human neurons, again, in most neonates, but this time expressing GCAM6 calcium indicator shortly uh, before the, the experiment uh, inducing this indicator to avoid any long-term toxicity. And then following surgery of uh, the same type I just uh, explained to you before, but this ca case imaging uh, uh, GCAM uh, signal, we looked at the responses, the potential responses of the human neurons in uh, uh, response to visual stimulation in, in the awake animal. And I'm sharing with you a, a movie that uh, I must say really stunned us when uh, we saw it for the first time in the lab. So you can see basically here uh, on the upper left, the type of stimuli that the mouse is looking at. And you can see here the various patterns of responses of all these neurons that you see here, uh, that you see here basically blinking as the stimuli are going on. And I hope you can uh, basically sense these are raw data it's very qualitative but i hope you can sense this way two important things number one that these neurons can respond to visual stimulation and of course that's the first exciting result but the second and i would say at least to my naive eyes at the time uh, unexpected result was that these neurons do not respond in the same way they all respond to a different stimulus and in fact, when we discussed this first with Vincent, I said this is not surprising at all because this is how the visual cortex works. Not every neuron is tuned in the same way. And in fact, uh, this was already the textbook view of the visual cortex, if you will, from Ubel and Riesel pioneer works. Uh, but this time uh, we, we, we see it, uh, perhaps for the first time looking at human neurons, but transplanted in, in, in the mouse brain. Now, what do I mean by tuning? Well, you see here that basically what they see are different patterns of direction and orientation with that, the typical way by which one can see this differential tuning. And you can see here an example of a cell that will typically only respond to, oops, I'm sorry, specific, uh, to specific uh, directions 
in, uh, in, in this quite robust way. And this is not just one human neuron by chance. In fact, uh, we were able uh, to, 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 to detect this uh, type of selectivity in many different types of human neurons. And just like the mouse neurons, you can see that these tunings vary from one neuron to another. And you can see that, uh, interestingly, the direction selectivity index, which is a way to basically uh, quantify this uh, diversity, if you will, is quite similar between human and mouse. While in terms of orientation selectivity, it seems to be less selective for human cells, which may be uh, actually interestingly from a developmental viewpoint, because orientation and direction don't develop in the, the same way. This is something that uh, we, we are interested to uh, pursue. But in any case, it seems like the responses of the human neurons resemble very much those recorded in mouse V1. Uh, one important uh, note of caution, though, is that not all neurons respond to visual stimuli. I would say uh, in the order of a third to a half of the neurons actually display these uh, robust responses. So there's still quite a few human neurons there in which we don't see GCAMP. Uh, spiking in responses to uh, to visual stimulation. But uh, of course, again, that may uh, suggest that not all human neurons are mature enough yet to, to get to these levels of connectivity or alternatively that they may be sensitive to other types of stimuli that we didn't find yet. Or, of course, not so surprisingly, that this is still and remains a, a quite a challenging experiment, but that uh, is still uh, uh, surprisingly uh, similar to the mouse to us. Now, I'm showing you here, I cannot resist, uh, some very recent data that Polona Jager, a new postdoc in the lab, uh, managed to actually uh, obtain uh, during those last uh, few weeks. Uh, we were lucky to be able to uh, perform a few experiments during the, during the still ongoing lockdown of this mouse that was already undergoing surgery. And in this case, what Polona looked at is that the binocular region of the cortex that is normally sensitive to both contralateral and ipsilateral eye. And she looks at this mostly because we want to look in the long run to plasticity in, uh, in those mice. But I'm just showing you here the responses of these mice that won't tell you, uh, of these neurons in this region, that's, that won't tell you so much, except that, again, it shows robust uh, and, as and asynchronous responses. But you can also see here that these neurons remarkably seem to be sensitive to both contralateral and ipsilateral stimuli, in this case tuned in the same or similar fashion. Uh, again, very similar to what's uh, shown in the mouse and suggesting again that these human neurons, and that would be, I would say, the, the take home message of what I just showed you, that xenotransplanted human cortical neurons appear to develop at their own pace. And yet they achieve substantial maturation and functional integration in the adult mouse brain. And, and I think this is uh, raising a number of questions that we're now trying to tackle in the lab. The first one that I will discuss further uh, uh, in the talk is that it really now, I think, uh, reinforces uh, our initial proposal that there is an intrinsic mechanism of timing of neuronal maturation that seems to be particularly extremely expanded in those human cortical cells revealed by the transplantation. And the question of the molecular and cellular mechanisms that underlie this intrinsic timing, I think, are absolutely fascinating uh, as much as they are mysterious at this point. The second question, or let's say uh, opportunity as well, is that this type of model could be used to study in a completely different way neurodevelopmental diseases, meaning that we could study human neurons affected by a particular genetic causing disease, uh, genetic mutation associated or causing neurodevelopmental disease, but we could look at these neurons in a much more physiological way, including looking at function and perhaps plasticity. Finally, and I will not have time to discuss this so much, but bear it in mind, if you will, I showed you that these neurons, even though they still remain kind of juvenile, when you think of their plasticity, when you think of their function, their dendritic spine dynamics and so on, they display all these juvenile features in an adult, fully adult neural circuit. And uh, to me as a developmental neurobiologist, this is really comes as a surprise. I think 20 or even 10 years ago, I would have thought this is just not, not possible. And I think it opens very interesting perspectives of studying what goes on in the brain when new neurons are confronted or participate to an old 
uh, circuit. Can that generate new types of function, plasticity, perhaps even repair? Um, I think uh, we are way beyond now, also thanks to the work of many other labs. Actually, I, I, I don't have time to, 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 um, to cite, but that basically challenge this view that uh, the adult brain is once and for all the adult brain. Uh, because at least in this case, I can show you that, we show, I showed you hopefully that experimentally, when human cells get there, they can actually sort of uh, uh, display their own uh, juvenile features as well. Now, let's focus first on those mechanisms of intrinsic timing. And I wish I could show you the full, uh, the, the full mechanism. I think it's going to take several years, if not several decades. Uh, I think more and more people are interested in this. And I think that's super cool. But let me tell you a little bit what, what we've been thinking of and what we're doing in the lab. Uh, and, I, and I pick up here this uh, 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 picture of this movie of the 90s, The Usual Suspect. Some of you maybe were not born at the time. This is what we the uh, already infamous uh, Kevin Spacey, who uh, was actually uh, guilty in the movie, but was never actually found uh, guilty because there were so many other suspects. And he looked like the least usual one. I think it's a nice metaphor of, of science and of the danger of, of what seems obvious. But anyway, um, the dangers or the opportunities actually of what, of what is obvious or less obvious. And that's basically what we're trying to do on the one hand, trying to look at, let's say, the perhaps the most likely suspects. And these include specific mechanisms such as human specific genes and synaptic genes. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in this context. And then maybe less likely or at least even likely, but less obvious, at least uh, uh, to, to me uh, uh, some time ago, general mechanisms such as changing in the gene regulatory networks of neuronal development, about which actually remarkably little is known at this point. There's a lot known about gene regulatory networks of neurogenesis or regional specification, but very little about te temporal specification and uh, maturation or even uh, uh, wider mechanisms such as metabolism. And I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in this context uh, uh, as well. So first, about the human-specific genes. So maybe uh, uh, many of you actually had the chance to hear Frank Poleux give us a, an amazing lecture on this same uh, uh, website, so to speak, uh, about his discovery of the SRGAP2 gene family. Uh, so a couple of years ago, together with Cécile Charrier, uh, they found that this SRGAP2A uh, gene that encodes a, a synaptic protein found in uh, inhibitory, but also excitatory uh, post-synaptic compartments uh, was duplicated in the human species. And as such, uh, some of these human specific paralogs can actually act as inhibitors of uh, the ancestral uh, protein, which is found in all mammals, and thereby can lead basically to delayed maturation of uh, the uh, synaptic, uh, or at least the, the dendritic spines of the cortical neurons, uh, following basically overexpression of the human specific gene in the mouse cortex. They also actually uh, interestingly show increased density of these spines, which is another feature characteristic of the human cortex compared with other species. So this is super exciting and Frank uh, has been working on this and he showed you his most recent data on this recently. But the key question that we've been wondering is whether this could actually be relevant in human neurons and whether physiologically SRGAP2 human, para human specific paradox could actually play a role in the intrinsic mechanisms of the timing of maturation I was telling you about. So to address this, uh, what we've been trying to do, and this uh, is mostly the work of Bast Baptiste Libé Filippo in the lab, in collaboration with Cécile and Franck, who basically uh, uh, gave us uh, um, constructs and advice to design basically ways to knock down specifically the human specific paralog and not the ancestor uh, SRGAP2 in human neurons. And so basically what Baptiste did is to differentiate the cells, then transplant them and then look at the development of the human cells in control conditions or following knockdown of those human specific paradox. And I remind you that those human specific paradox, when overexpressed in the mouse, lead to 
um, delayed maturation of the mouse uh, neurons. Well, what we see here is that when knocking down the human-specific paradox in the human cells, seems to uh, basically increase the density of the spines as well as uh, their, uh, their size. But you can see that the most dramatic effect is on the density, strongly suggesting to us that it's basically accelerating the development of the dendritic spines in, in the human cells. And that in this case, the human specific SRGAP2C may be actually one of the components required as a, a, a component of, let's say, the intrinsic clock that somehow is responsible for the timing of maturation of human neurons. Of course, a lot of more work needs to be done. This is still uh, ongoing. Uh, but I think it shows you at least what could be done with our model uh, and what could be done to try to look at other genes as well and try to understand at the single gene level the relationship with uh, timing of maturation. Now, this is for, let's say, human-specific as well as synaptic genes. Now, let me give you another example of what we're trying to do, this time looking at uh, global mechanisms. So understand global mechanisms of neuronal development is, is you know, like a, a lifetime project, if you will. Uh, and when we started to be interested in this uh, some time ago, and a person who really initiated a lot of this in the lab is Hiro Iwata again. It's in this frame also that uh, he improved considerably the transplantation paradigm, was that, in fact, we have very little knowledge of what goes on during the differentiation of the neurons at the molecular or at the molecular level at the cellular level yes but at the molecular level uh, actually very little um, whether in the mouse or in any other species uh, quite surprisingly so what he developed is a system uh, that we call nnn labeling for neuro d1 uh, uh, newborn neuron labeling where it's a genetic trick basically where we trigger cre rt2 expression under the control of neuro d1 and doing so uh, we can add tamoxifen to the cells. These can be human cells or mouse cells, for instance. And we can precisely date the cells that were born at the time of tamoxifen addition, thanks to a genetic label. And this is important because in most systems that people have used, whether mouse or human, you are dealing with a collection of cells that were born at different time points. So that if you want to understand how the calendar looks like, well, you need the calendar of, the, board, of the, neur the neuron that was born at this particular time. If you mix up the calendars of the neurons that were born today, one month ago, one week ago, uh, one hour ago, you will not understand anything of the roadmap, of the temporal roadmap of neuronal development. Well, anything may be a strong word, but at least uh, you may miss critical aspects of it. So hence the development of this system. And this is just to show you the morphology. Uh, and you can see here single neurons uh, together with, the, their, the, they are the only ones labeled, but they're surrounded by other neurons that you don't see here. But you can see here them labeled. They got tamoxifen uh, at day 32 of differentiation for these human neurons. And you can see them here 20 days, 40 days, and 60 days following their maturation. We can see them, in this case, their morphological maturation. But we can look at other things. And one of the things we've been starting to look at is basically global patterns, such as uh, metabolism, and what I'm showing you now um, is, uh, is what we've been doing, and this is the work of Rio as well as Pierre Casimir, a PhD student in the lab, focusing on mitochondria. Why mitochondria? Well, because mitochondria have been shown before to be very important for neuronal morphogenesis and neuronal function, even though not much has been done on development itself. Um, and mitochondria is involved in a lot of key aspects of neuronal patterning and function, uh, whether it's about metabolism or uh, signaling. And uh, it, it also basically comes actually from a very interesting observation that Rio did some time ago. And you can see a lot of it actually here on this bioarchive paper, where he showed that uh, in newborn neurons, whether in the mouse or the human actually, the mitochondria are extremely small and fragmented. There's a lot of fission going on for these mitochondria right after birth of the neuron. But then you can see that later on, the neurons grow their mitochondria and they start to have largely fused mitochondria and their dendrites and cell bodies after about two, three weeks uh, in, in the mouse. And then they resemble the ones that most people are more familiar with that, that study neuronal function. But now if we do the same experiment with human cells, with what we find basically with the same birth dating is that at about the same timelines, 
the mitochondria are still quite fragmented and in, in low number, they start to grow, but they remain fragmented. And it's only later on, and in fact, even two months after differentiation, they have not yet reached the plateau that we start to see after two to four weeks in the mouse. So this is ongoing work, but that strongly suggests to us that there's basically a species-specific speed of growth and fusion of mitochondria during neuronal differentiation. Now, it raises several interesting questions. One of them is what are the links of mitochondria with neuronal differentiation itself? What are its links with metabolism or signaling? But whatever that is, I think the, the take home message for me is that whatever controls the timing of neuronal maturation is likely to be upstream of this. So it's likely to be a very global aspect of the cell differentiation since it seemed to act on dendritic growth and synapses on the, on the one hand, but also on mitochondria uh, and very basic features uh, on the other hand. And so this, I think, suggests to us that there may be actually several clocks, if you will, or several ways to uh, act upon the clock, some very specific, uh, such as the synaptic genes I told you about, some much more global, and we will see with time whether mitochondria are important or not, or maybe other aspects of metabolism, as well as gene regulatory networks that I, I won't have time to uh, touch upon today, but that we study a lot as well. Okay, so I don't know how I'm doing with time. I will try to wrap up, but show you one last example of what we can do uh, with uh, uh, human neurons genotransplanted in the mouse. And uh, in this case, to try to model uh, a specific uh, neurodevelopmental disease. And in this case, this is a disease called by SYNGAP1 mutation. SYNGAP1 is the third most abundant protein in the synapse. It displays mutations that are actually quite frequent in kids affected by ID, uh, intellectual disability, and autism spectrum disorder, IDESD. And interestingly, uh, work in the mouse has shown before that synaptic maturation appears to be accelerated in the, in the mouse model uh, 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 of these mutations. That, and that's really what triggered our curiosity, obviously. So what we've done, basically, uh, this is the work of, of, of a lot of people that uh, I, I, I show you here but it's Rio in particular who's been uh, uh, generating here, as you can see, knockout lines for the SYNGAP1 gene in, in human cells, and then transplanted them. And again, I'm gonna uh, summarize here the work of many people that is all ongoing. So uh, please uh, be indulgent and we will see, let's say how, how, how it goes in the end. But what we've been doing, for instance, is to transplant knockout and control cells in the same animal with different fluorescent labels. This enables us then to look at both types of cells in the same animal, in this case, using in vivo imaging uh, by, by Ben again. And the impression that we had from these in vivo imaging data is that basically, as you can see here, the, the knockout cells seem to display higher density and bigger spines than the control at a similar time point. And this was confirmed using ex vivo uh, anatomical imaging of, of these spines. And also, in a way, uh, independently uh, confirmed or strongly suggested by electrophysiology performed of these types of neurons, where we see that there is increased in synaptic uh, uh, connectivity of uh, these neurons. So suggesting that synaptic development is accelerated in these cells. So again, what are the underlying mechanisms? What does it mean exactly? I think that uh, will take uh, months, if not years, to, to move on. But I'm, I'm showing you this as a, an example of what can be done. And I will wrap up here and try to give you maybe three important, uh, what I think important uh, home messages. One is that, so, well, the first general one being that uh, I hope I convinced you that there seems to be a species specific temporal patterning of human neuronal maturation uh, and connectivity. And that it seems to be largely cell intrinsic, both for morphogenesis and synaptogenesis that it may involve, a, from a mechanistic perspective, both synaptic and general mechanisms, both human-specific and maybe uh, more uh, uh, conserved ones. And finally, I showed you uh, an interest data that would support, in, of course, in a very speculative way at this point, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about, that the speed of neuronal maturation, the speed maybe of circuit maturation, may be linked to some neurodevelopmental disease. It is often thought that uh, the brain develops uh, too slowly uh, with intellectual disability, but who knows? Maybe some of, of uh, 
defects that lead to acceleration of the development may be also detrimental. Again, this is food for thought. So I will stop there and thank the many people involved in this work. I hope I did not forget uh, most of the primary actors, in particular, Daniele, Ben, uh, and Rio, as I showed you, this wonderful collaboration that we have with Vincent Bonin here in Leuven, oops, sorry, uh, as well as with Franck Boleu and Cécile, who is now at ENS in Paris. Here are all uh, the amazing people uh, in my lab. I apologize to those of you who I, in the lab, I didn't have the time to, to show you the data uh, because we, we have a lot more ongoing, actually. And with that, uh, I will stop and thank uh, all of you to, to, to bear with me uh, up until now. Thanks a lot for your attention. All right, Pierre, I'm the only one uh, audibly clapping, but as you will see, as soon as I close the video and you get back uh, to our main screen, there's going to be some... Uh, emoticons uh, appearing so you weren't alone in your room everybody was out there and thanks for sharing these uh, these nice data in particular for sharing the unpublished part of your work so we're now uh, reaching the the q a part of the discussion so the way um, this goes is that uh, people have asked questions throughout your talk and uh, are asking uh, them as we go so i'm going to read them out loud to you um okay and um, there, there's been votes on the questions, meaning the <laughs> in principle are, are, are ranked by, by uh, perceived relevance. So I'll, I'll start with the first one uh, from Esther Klingler. What is the layer identity of the transplanted human neurons? Do they keep their identity in terms of gene expression, layer position, and connectivity in the mouse cortex? Yeah, that's a great question. So in short, uh, as you may have noticed, many of the neurons end up in the deep layers. And for the reason that we uh, differentiate them before transplantation at early time points, many of them have a deep layer identity, okay? That said, there are quite a few also that uh, can end up in the upper layers. So meaning that there is not a strict uh, univocal relationship between the layer identity and the layer location. But I think we, we have not looked at it in sufficient detail for me to give you, you know, a, a, a firm conclusion, in particular because we have mostly transplanted deep layer neurons, and because for technical reasons they just end up in deep layers. So okay. I'm, I, I hope that answers the question. And we were in the process, basically, of, of of trying to set up system where we can enrich for upper layer neurons before transplanting, and then see whether that changed the layer patterning, the layer location. I think that would be a very uh, interesting result. Of course, it goes in line with you know, the work of Denis and many others about what exactly in all what's intrinsic and extrinsic in what we discussed is about the specification of, of the cells. And I must confess, this is something that we still need to discuss in, to, to study in more, in more depth. So in, in, the, in the neurons that were responding to visual input, these were also deep layer neurons mostly? Many of them are, were in the upper layers, yes. Uh -huh. and, and quite a few have upper layer neurons as well, huh? uh, markers. So you see, this is where I'm saying I'm, I, I, I really don't want to say they're just following layer identity and location. I think it would be wrong. Um, and in any case, it seems that uh, it does not, even if there is some mismatch uh, between deep and upper layer location and identity, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is likely to be the case, it mm -hmm. does not seem to hinder their functional integration as much as we could look at it for now. But again, I think, we need more data uh, on this. Thank you for asking this question. Okay. Do you th question from Isabel Caillé. Do you think the species-specific timing is linked to the overall protein stability as suggested by the Briscoe lab? Yes, I suggested. Uh, yeah, I saw, of course, this, this nice bioarchive paper from Briscoe lab. There's also actually another lab uh, interested in uh, uh, somite segmentation that uh, came out with a very interesting paper and, and, and coming with similar conclusions, so suggesting that protein stability and also perhaps delay of protein production may be linked to species-specific timing of maturation. I think it could well be the case uh, in part in what we see here. Uh, I find it very intriguing, of course, in light of what we found for mitochondria. Mitochondria is involved in protein translation for sure, uh, but also more to the point, you need uh, active 
or specific patterns of metabolism to generate proteins and to degrade them. So mm -hmm. I think uh, perhaps we're all looking at something similar in a different way, or perhaps we're looking at different types of clocks. Uh, but I think uh, indeed it further suggests that a uh, general mechanism may be at stake. That said, I think really what's critical that uh, all of us need to do now is find ways, we're trying to do that with mitochondria, but it's not easy, to actually go beyond correlation. And of course, that's always the problem with Evo Devo. You can find all the differences between that, that you want between species uh, and, and, and come up with intrinsic or extrinsic mechanisms. But at the end of the day, you want to be able to pinpoint a specific molecular component, knock it down or overexpress it, and yeah. change the clock. And I think that's the, the bullet, uh, the, 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 the million dollar <laughs> bullet that I think uh, a lot of us are going to be uh, after. I think there are going to be many bullets, hopefully. And that will be super exciting, I think, in, uh, in, in, the, in the future to look after. So related to that, Paulina Oberst asks whether you could uh, speed up maturation by increasing protein turnover, for example. Yes. So uh, I, I, the problem, yeah, I think, I think this is something that we should test. Question, of course, is you know, how to accelerate protein turnover in a way that will not, uh, you know, damage the specification of the cells and so on. But that 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 typically uh, is something that uh, that that could be tested in the same way. Now we're trying to, for instance, change the rates of fusion or growth of mitochondria. There are also ways to interfere with metabolism. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also interesting links that uh, we and others uh, are uncovering between mitochondria and uh, chromatin remodeling. And I think that could be actually a very interesting link as well to understand how fast uh, cells can differentiate. Um, yeah, I mean, the sky is the limit, really, about the types of experiments to do and the types of things to test. Uh, I think it's it, it's super exciting. And yes, I think the only way to answer the question is to do the experiments. And yeah. Yeah, so a thought it's... experiment here by Isabel Martinez Garre. If you were to transplant neurons from a species with faster neuronal development than the mouse, do you think the mouse brain environment would be permissive to a faster development mm -hmm. or would it limit the rate of maturation? Yes, this is a great uh, suggestion. In short, we have not done this experiment. I would love to transplant, for instance, fly neurons in the mouse and see what happens. I don't know what Bassem would think about that. Um, but um, and we have we have been looking at, at ways to do this because there are rodents that appear to display faster development than the mouse, and we could get a hold on, on cortical cells and, and do this. Um, I think, yeah, Bassem says, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. We could um, put the whole fly. We could put the whole fly in the brain ventricle, yes. But then then we're back to the problem we had some time ago that. I think a good transplantation experiment is an experiment where cells are single and where they're able to interact with the whole niche, a bit like what you've done with mouse to mouse with temporal patterning. I think it's very important to do this in the right way technically. Uh, so we would need single cells. Um, yeah. All right. One question from Benedict Berniger. Are there layer specific differences in human spine dynamics? Are there differences in the maturation pace of human deep and upper layer pyramidal neurons? Yeah, so that's so a great. Pace. Yes, that's a great question. So as I tried to explain earlier, I think we are too crude at this point. I think for any model actually of human neuronal development, you know, to really get into the it's not details actually, yeah, to get into the bone of the differences between deep and upper layers um, because of the technical reasons that I, I explained before. Another thing that mm -hmm. we haven't touched upon is for instance, you know, apical versus basal uh, dendrites. Of course, when they are transplanted, it's a little bit odd, right? Because they're not like strictly, completely uh, radial in every case. Uh, but I think that would be very interesting because uh, for instance, what would be interesting to find out is, you know, what is their input? Uh, would there be a differential input to basal and apical dendrites? in relation also with the layer in which the neuronal cell bodies are, like in vivo, and whether that influence the, the patterns of dendritic spine, uh, that would be interesting. Because it's true that, I and maybe I, I could click, quickly slip this into uh, my, my answer, uh, 
I know I've been insisting a lot and probably too much about you know what's intrinsic. This is not to say that there are no extrinsic components required for neuronal maturation. And one interesting one I want to emphasize is that all the dendritic spines that I showed you were all in vivo because we never find these in vitro. Because the full program of dendritic spine maturation, I think, requires extrinsic cues and extrinsic context of the brain, of the functioning brain. Uh, and so that aspect, not the timing it takes, but the result that you get, the end point, where you get to, is actually dependent on extrinsic cues. Okay. In the meantime, someone is proposing to provide you with octopus neurons. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Ev. That's a great idea as well. Yes. And we could put fly in the octopus and then in the, in the mouse as well. Yes. In terms of connectivity, have you ever observed long-range projections, callosal or other, from these human xenotransplanted cells? Yeah, from yes. Sure, yeah. So we, we, we've done that a lot, actually. Uh, and we published it a while ago. That's why I did not insist. Uh, oh, a lot of this is actually in a paper published by former postdoc Hiraz Punica Macho in Neuron in 2013, together with our collaborator Afsane Gaia. And we looked in great detail. And to, to make a long story short, we found that the uh, pattern of axonal output in terms of axons look very similar to the pattern of uh, those of endogenous cortical pyramidal neurons, whether to the thalamus, to the midbrain, uh, to the hindbrain, uh, for instance. And interestingly, this is something that we noted with mouse transplantation as well, they seem to display area-specific patterns, meaning that they are actually mostly display visual-like identity or occipital cortex-like identity for reasons that we still don't fully understand, but my bias on this is that it's because occipital identity may be a kind of default pathway in the dish that is then continuing following transplantation. But so the axonal output fits with their identity. Uh, what we have not done is whether this axonal output can drive function in these targets and, and, and behavior eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that uh, actually we're we're pursuing, and we have very interesting project ongoing, uh, performed by Ben in collaboration with Vincent, to look at the impact of the transplanted human neurons on visual function, including at the behavioral level. Okay. Uh, question from Victor Borel: Do human neurons transplanted in, mo in mouse motor cortex then become motor neurons, is or is this integration selective to a single sensory mod modality? It kind of relates to what you alluded to. Yes. So the integration is not area specific. You can get these cells everywhere, but the pattern of output that they display will remain mostly occipital-like in all the experiments that we performed before. So strongly suggesting, like the initial experiments that Afsane actually performed many years ago with mouse-to-mouse -mouse transplantation, that if you take embryonic cells uh, at a stage where they are fated to aerial identity, they will not change. This is not to say that you cannot find an earlier stage where they, they actually don't have a fate and where they will maybe be influenced, for instance, by thalamic axons mm -hmm. and, and, and adopt a motor neuronal fate. Uh, but at this point, again, it's pointing a strong intrinsic component to this aspect in our experimental model. Okay, another question by Victor. Um, how many types of cortical neurons form uh, from trans in the mouse from transplantation of a quote-unquote homogeneous cell population in a dish? You mean from human cells or, or mouse yeah, cells? Or... Yeah, it's, it's very hard to, to know at this point. We are performing actually quite a lot now of single cell transcriptome analysis, mm -hmm. both in vitro in a dish, we're comparing it with uh, organoid data sets, we're comparing it with human fetal cortex, and we compare it with neurons that we uh, harvest from transplanted mice. And I think this will be the way to answer your question. And uh, yeah, it's hard to predict. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the diversity found in the human fetal cortex. Um, how it will compare with purely in vitro settings, how it will compare with the patterns of identity that are purely physiological, uh, I think single cell transcriptome is, is probably the way to, to answer these very important questions. Mm -hmm. A question from Shubatole. If spine maturation dynamics maintains the timeline of the species of origin, then the process may not be input dependent or input responsive. 
Um, yes, that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, well, I don't know because uh, maybe it means that the, that what matters is the timing to acquire the capacity to respond to the extrinsic. Mm -hmm. So I don't think our data necessarily suggests that uh, what I showed you is completely independent of the input. In fact, I gave you right before the example of synaptic, mat uh, I'm sorry, dendritic spine maturation that is clearly largely dependent of the transplantation because we never see that as robustly or any anywhere near what we in a dish. So, but but the time to respond to it may be determined by the, those various clocks, including what we discussed, the sargap 2 c metabolism, uh, transcription, and, and, and so on. That's so the way never to manipulate activity of those neurons uh, yeah. with yes. or things like that. That is a great suggestion. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, our colleague David Gall, uh, who, who played with these human neurons uh, before with us, uh, who is from uh, ULB, is actually doing a project with us, uh, testing exactly that using mm -hmm. optogenetic tools mm -hmm. to ask whether patterns of activity could change uh, the, the, the timing. I mean, let's not forget one thing when it, again, to come to intrinsic, extrinsic influence. The reason why those human neurons display these, to me, amazingly tuned responses to visual stimuli is not intrinsic. It's because they are in a, in a circuit where neurons are tuned to specific stimuli. And these neurons are somehow connected to the human neurons in a way that is preferential, that we need to find out exactly, such that then they respond to specific stimuli. So I think it will always be an interplay, of course, with, with extrinsic cues. But the timing itself uh, may be the least sensitive component of neuronal maturation, the least sensitive to extrinsic uh, uh, environment. And as you know, there are lots of people who are trying to accelerate the development. There are quite a few questions, Pierre, so maybe okay. some... Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, we, we don't need to, look, to go through all of them. Uh, still, this one has... We're at nine votes. It started with, I think, 24 votes. So we're at nine. Do you think the timing of neuronal maturation is somehow hard-encoded genetically according to the lifetime of each species by yeah. Hassan Mohammed. Did I say that? No, I didn't say that. I, I, I think it's genetically encoded. Now, how it is related to the lifespan, I don't know. There are papers out there that, you know, don't, have made these very interesting comparisons between lifespan, between uh, developmental timing, also between metabolic rate. I think we need to re-explore all of these uh, with with more modern tools to to address uh, to address this. But that said, um, I think again the, the 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 answer. I'm sorry to be a bit vague, maybe, but I think the answer is going to be dual. I think there will be a generic pattern, a generic clock that can be changed across evolution, and where many things are changed, including maybe lifespan. And then there may be specific mechanisms that are selected in particular species. I'm thinking of Sargap2C, for instance, that probably mm -hmm. has nothing to do with lifespan, but seems, as I showed you, to have to do with dendritic spine maturation. So it's going to be, not mm -hmm. surprisingly, uh, highly conserved mechanisms that change, and then some new mechanism that maybe come into place, maybe okay. likely for more selective features of the neurons. OK. Do you have a way to discriminate discriminate between the intrinsic maturation of transplanted neurons and the role of the niche? Uh, for example, if mouse neurons were transplanted in a human 3D organoid model, would neurons still mature as fast as they do compared to human neurons? You, you kind of answered that, uh, alluding to the fact that you were trying these types of experiments, correct? Can you quickly uh, repeat the question? I got the lost. Question time um, I guess the second part summarizes the question. If you were to transplant mouse neurons in a human organoid, what mm -hmm. would happen in terms of timing of development? What ah, would yeah, you that's, a, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, it's true. That would be feasible to put mouse yeah. in a human organoid. Yeah, we should definitely do it. Yes, I like that idea. And we make human organoids in the lab. We could put mouse cells. You want to make a bet here on what would happen and we talk in six months? 
well, my bet will be intrinsic. So my bet will be that the mouse neurons will, will develop fast. They will probably be much easier to handle than the human organoids that, as uh, many of us know, are really a hurdle because they take so much time to develop. Uh, no, that's a cool experiment. We should do this. Yeah. A question from Michel Studer. Um, if mouse and human maturation have different timings, timings, how can they properly interact and be functional? Is there a specific time that this happens? This probably relates to Shuba's question. Yeah, so indeed, uh, that, that, uh, that's a great question. Again, if you had asked me 10 years ago, is this experiment going to work? I would have said, no way. No way a young neuron is going to find the, the instructive cues to elaborate something that looks like physiological connectivity with the old neurons. And yet they seem to be able to do so. In fact, we see also area-specific patterns of axonal output uh, following transplantation in the adult mouse. So that again suggesting that, uh, although it's following a lesion, so that shows that you need a lesion then to maybe rejuvenate the adult mouse brain to, 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 to get to that. So there's not, there's no, there's not seem to be a critical moment for the host, for the human neurons to be able to do this. Um, that, that's my answer. Okay. There's a question from Brittany Davis on uh, myelination. Have you looked at that? Do they do they receive a proper complement of myelin, and what does it yes, look like? Yes, following uh, hi Brittany, we have we have not looked at that in the new paradigm of transplantation. We've we've looked at that in the past, and we found actually together with Afsane uh, good evidence of engulfing of of the uh, ongoing axons by oligodendrocytes, including making myelin sheets. Now, how this hap is happening here uh, in this particular model, we have not looked. Okay. Um, cognitive per performance and transplantations, any, specific, any uh, speculations there? <laughs> so my speculation about that will be the same that if you ask me to speculate about the cognitive properties of, uh, of human organoids, I think a brain is much more than a bowel of cells, and it's much more than a few, even thousands of cells transplanted in a mouse brain. So I don't, I, I don't expect any, you know, humanization of the mouse behavior in any way by this. Mm -hmm. That said, the interesting thing in my, in my view, again, you would say I'm a bit biased if not obsessed, is, and that is something we want to explore, is whether the fact that the cells are juvenile may transfer juvenile properties to the transplanted cells. And you mm -hmm. know there is a precedent, which is interneurons that when transplanted heterochronically can change the critical period in the mouse. So this is something that actually, uh, that's a project of Polona to see whether the mouse neurons would change in terms of, uh, of their uh, plasticity or their age, if you will, when the young neurons are around. And of course that then could perhaps lead to changes in cognitive performance uh, so that that and it would tell us basically because i think nobody has asked this but i think this remains an open question which is that you know, it's been proposed for many years uh, decades that human neoteny is at the origin of many of the higher specific cognitive features of our species but again there's not much experimental evidence so perhaps mm -hmm. the types of experiments that we do and that others are doing to get interested about the timing of development will enable us to basically answer this simple question, which is, does it actually matter how much time a circuit takes to develop in terms of its final function? And I think that's, that's a question that remains open, but I think there are many and more and more ways coming to address it experimentally. Yeah. Um, the next one is one that I actually had raised relating to whether what you're observing is plasticity or natural selections of the cells that are basically fit to integrate the place where they are. Like what's the fractions of cell fraction of cells that ultimately integrates upon the one that you're transplanting? Yeah. So I mentioned that among the cells that we see in the cortex at the time of functional analysis, it's at best half of the cells that respond, right? Um, so it means a bunch of cells are there that do not seem to be responses to the visual stimuli that, uh, that, uh, that we do, yet they're still around. So what, maybe they receive other types of stimuli, that I don't know. But so that's, that's for one thing. So um, 
we see a slight decrease. We have not, never quantified it, but we sense that there may be a decrease, let's say, from the first months to the first year following the transplantation, the number of cells that we find in the cortex. Now, whether that is actually true selection or other things, because, you know, those mice are immunodeficient, so when they're one year old, they're not super healthy. So we don't know. I think an interesting thing to do in that, in that sense, again, an experiment we'd like to do, is to change the environment of the mice, putting them in an enriched environment, for instance, and see whether that has an impact on the number of neurons that we see integrate. But for now, I would think the rate of integration does not seem to be dependent so much on, on, on activity uh, itself. I think it may have to do with something else, the fact that some cells are uh, connected or not afterwards. Okay. Any evidence of pruning in the transplanted cells? No. Uh, I, I, I mean, we've looked at it, you know, in, in, in a way with great detail, huh? uh, when looking at the adrenic spine dynamics, and if you look at the numbers, you will see that we don't see, in the timeline where we look at it, uh, a clear increase in the decrease of dendritic spines, uh, uh, while the outgrowth would reach a plateau, which would be what would looks like uh, pruning. Uh, now, whether it means that there's something missing, or more to the point, I think, that we are too early, because synaptic pruning in human neurons only occur much later, after birth, uh, in the years following birth. So it could be that maybe we're just too early to see that type of pruning. But it could okay. also be that there's some kind of mismatch. One thing that we could do, for instance, is to add more human types of cells, like glial cells, microglia, and see how pruning would look like. OK. And maybe one last question. Um, have you tried to change the endogenous mouse SRGAP to C or SYNGAP1 and replace them by their human parallels? If so, yes, if so. Do you observe the same developmental pace pattern as with human neurons? So what is the, the, the experiment in question here? Well, to put uh, humanized forms of the SRGAP2C or the SYNGAP1. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, yes, that experiment has been done by Frank uh, and his colleagues. Uh, you can actually check his talk. I think he's talking quite a bit about it. Um, interestingly, the bulk of the, I mean, it would be better if, if he could comment on this. Uh, but interestingly, the bulk of the phenotype that he sees is more about the impact of SRGAP2C on final dendritic spine density. And not so much on the maturation rate, but that's mostly because maybe he explored it in a different way. And, and uh, my understanding is that I think when uh, he or others will explore in more detail those humanized mice, they will show, like following in neutral electroporation, prolonged maturation of the cortical uh, mouse, of the mouse cortical neurons. But mm -hmm. this is work in progress from Frank's lab. You can contact him. I'm sure he'll be happy to, uh, to feed yeah. you on this. All right. I think we're going to stop here, Pierre. Thank you so much for, for taking the time, all for right. going through. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. And thank you for all the questions. That was, uh, you know, also a, a rejuvenation to be transplanted in in the worldwide web of, you know, uh, all the colleagues and so on. Uh, so I hope everybody takes care and keeps safe. And we see each other very, very soon. I don't know when is the beer hour, actually, Denis, uh, which I suppose we're having now, but... Yeah, I'll give you a call and a place, tell you the place. <laughs> have to keep it secret, yeah. Okay. Uh, before we leave, just one important note, the next uh, developmental worldwide web neuro, whichever order you wanted to put it in, is not going to be on Thursday, but on Monday. So update your calendars Mondays, Monday at 5 p.m. Uh, and it's going to be uh, Simon Hippenmeyer from the IST uh, in, in Vienna. So don't miss it and please update your calendars. Uh, until then, have a safe uh, and good weekend and um, see you. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. All right. Bye, everyone.